Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. This Learn Shop is on continuous renal replacement therapy and this is part one, which is the introduction. The learning objectives for this Learn Shop are first of all just to overview what continuous renal replacement therapy is, the rationale for continuous renal replacement therapy, let's review some renal anatomy and physiology basically and some renal pathophysiology which deals with acute um, kidney injury. Then we'll look at the mechanisms of solute and solvent removal and some of the CRT, continuous renal replacement therapy, mechanisms. So what is CRRT, continuous renal replacement therapy? Well, in acute renal failure, old terminology, acute kidney injury, there's an abrupt reduction in kidney function with an elevation in blood urea and plasma creatinine and associated oliguria or possibly even worse anuria. Renal replacement therapy then is a treatment that removes waste products, salts and excess water from the body. It can be intermittent, intermittent renal replacement therapy, or it can be continuous, continuous renal replacement therapy, which is what we're discussing here in this Learn Shop. Now, continuous renal replacement therapy is performed continuously without interruption. It's typically vena venous, which means access is from two veins, and is considered to have advantages over intermittent renal replacement therapy, which include increased hemodynamic stability, the patients don't get hypotensive as often. There's a lower incidence of hypotension then. There's an improved survival and a greater likelihood of renal recovery because if the kidneys are already subjected to um, a traumatic incident that reflects hypotension, then intermittent renal replacement therapy can be a little bit aggressive and it can actually damage the kidney further. Continuous renal replacement therapy has a tendency not to do that. So if we comprehend what continuous renal replacement therapy is, well look, you've got a patient, you've got access in the right arm, so blood is taken out, the dirty blood is pulled out of the body by the blood pump via a negative pressure. Negative pressure sucks it out. The pressure created by blood leaving the body is negative. It's the blood pump that actually pulls the blood out of the body and pushes it through the filter and then returns it back to the body. There can be anticoagulation, as you'll see in other learn shops associated with this course, but it doesn't have to have anticoagulation, it depends. It depends on what the physician order is and whether there's a contraindication for anticoagulation or a requirement. As it approaches the filter, the pre-filter pressure is positive. And in the filter, there could be dialysate, which is clean. Then the filtrate comes out with the dialysate, which is dirty. It's not really dirty, but it's high in waste products or whatever you want to remove. So the hemofilter essentially is cleaning the blood. Then it returns back and before it enters the body there's usually an air detector because we don't want to cause an air embolism. So the air detector is a safety mechanism that monitors the blood returning to the patient's body and then the cleaned blood which is lower in waste products, urea and creatinine or whatever product it's wanting to be removed could be high potassium it returns to the body under a positive pressure. Continuous renal replacement therapy. One, dirty blood is pulled out of the body by the blood pump via a negative pressure. Two, it goes through the hemofilter which cleans the blood and it depends on the therapy and mechanism that we're employing. And three, the clean blood then returns to the body via a positive pressure. It's pushed back in again. Now what's the rationale for continuous renal rate replacement therapy? Um, when can we use it? Why can we use it? Why do we use it? First of all, it can be used if the patient who's critically ill has got respiratory failure, 
due to diuretic refractory pulmonary edema, which can be cardiogenic or it can be pulmonary. It's not responding to diuretics. Nutritional requirements. The critical ill patient could be volume overloaded with excessive fluid, so therefore CRRT can be employed to reduce the body fluid load. Neurological anomalies. So therefore medication refractory cerebral edema. Not working. So therefore CRT can be employed to take away excessive fluid from the body again. You've got heart failure, which could be refractory to vasopressors such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine, and this results in systemic and pulmonary edema, reducing the fluid load. And renal failure or acute kidney injury, which is diuretic refractory. What's some of the commencement criteria? Well, it's numerous. Just three of these, according to the academics, is a requirement to commence CRT. So if the patient has oliguria, anuria, azotemia, essentially here they've got a high nitrogen load. Uremic complications, severe hyperkalemia, severe dysentremia, refractory pulmonary edema, removal of inflammatory cytokines, which occur in sepsis and septic shock, refractory metabolic acidosis, hyperpyrexia, because they will and can become hypothermic. So it could be a way of reducing temperature in a septic patient. Removal of pathogenic proteins, imminent ongoing massive blood transfusions, and as I indicated, removal of septic mediators, which could be cytokines. Anasaka, multi-organ failure, drug overdose with water-soluble toxins. Three of these are considered criteria to commence or consider commencing continuous renal replacement therapy. What are the generic goals of continuous, or continuous renal replacement therapy or CRT? It's to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, homeostasis. Maintain acid-base balance, homeostasis. Prevent further renal damage or injury. Promote healing and recovery. It's considered to be, for want of a better term, more gentle than intermittent renal replacement therapy, which we call hemodialysis. What are the advantages of CRT? Well, you only need venous access. With intermittent renal replacement therapy, you need arterial access and venous access or an AV shunt. There's no need for hemodialysis staff. Typically, critical care staff are able to care for patients on CRRT. There are minimal fluctuations in the biochemistry. It's continuous, daily, weekly, not just for three or four hours, bang, fluid removal, and can result in certain other anomalies like disequilibration syndrome. It sustains hemodynamic stability and it appears to give greater cumulative clearances. The patient can receive IV and nasogastric feeds. There's no need for a water supply access as with intermittent renal replacement therapy and it minimizes and reduces cerebral edema which minimizes or doesn't allow disequilibration syndrome to occur. What are some of the disadvantages? Well, because it's continuous, there's an increased risk of infection. It does require anticoagulation therapy because you don't want the lines, the filters, to coagulate. However, coagulation of the filter and tubing can occur. There's an increased lactate load for the patient, promoting lactic acidosis in the filtrate solutions, as you'll see when we review some of the solutions with certain therapies. There can be fluid balance errors, potential hypotension still, and it may promote hypothermia. And the filter surface area is reasonably small, less than two meters squared. What are some of the potential complications associated with continuous renal replacement therapy? An air embolism, 
That's why typically most circuits have an air detector. Hemorrhage, especially if they're getting anticoagulation. Thrombosis, because it's now a circuit that promotes an inflammatory response. Hypo or hypothermia, sepsis, hyper or hypocalcemia, hyper or hypoglycemia, and there can be an associated electrolyte imbalance, potassium, sodium, chloride, magnesium. Okay, now let's review the renal anatomy. First of all, we'll look at the macro, the big parts. So the urinary system essentially consists of the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and urethra. The components are the renal cortex, which is the outer part that filters the blood. And then you've got the renal medulla, which is the inner part, which contains the renal pyramids, where urine is formed. In the microanatomy, it consists of essentially two main parts, the nephrons and the collecting tubules, or ducts. And the nephron is divided into two parts, the renal corpuscles, which consists of the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, and the tubules, which consist of the proximal convoluted tubules, the loop of Henle, and the distant convoluted tubules. Now, if we look at the renal physiology, each nephron has a microscopic selective filter called a glomerulus, which is just a tuft or a network of capillaries that produce or produces glomerular filtrate from filtered blood. The Bowman's capsule collects the filtrate and passes it to the proximal tubule, to the loop of Henle, and to the distal tubule. And the filtrate is processed in the tubules to form urine. It's a selective filter which allows small molecules such as water, creatinine, cytokines, urea to pass. But it doesn't allow large proteins to pass, such as erythrocytes, red blood cells, or white blood cells, such as leukocytes. Okay, so what does the kidney do? Well, the kidney's got numerous functions. One is homeostasis in maintaining acid-base balance. Normal pH, as we discussed in the arterial blood gas loan shot, of the blood is normally 7.35 to 7.45. And to maintain this range, the kidneys have to excrete acids and bases. Water balance is another function. The kidneys have to maintain a stable water balance, and it does so by regulating the volume of urine produced. They adapt to the hydration level. For example, when you drink a lot, as you know, the kidneys produce more urine, or should. And the opposite happens when you're dehydrated. They produce less. Electrolyte balance as well. Some electrolytes are filtered back from the blood in the urine and returned back into the circulation. Potassium, sodium, magnesium, chloride. Electrolytes such as sodium and potassium and phosphate are largely dependent on a stable kidney system. Removing toxins and waste products. It's the kidney's responsibility to filter out water-soluble waste products and toxins and insert them into the urine. In renal failure or in an acute kidney injury, the body's waste products such as urea, creatinine, and uric acid build up very, very, very quickly and the person goes into a metabolic acidosis. Controlling blood pressure is another function of the kidney. The kidneys produce an enzyme called renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen, which is produced in the liver, into angiotensin 1, which is converted in the lungs to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor and therefore can increase the blood pressure. Alternatively, when the blood pressure is too high, the kidneys produce more urine to reduce the circulating blood volume. This is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The kidneys also produce a hormone called erythropoietin. And the main function is to create erythrocytes which are essential for the transport of oxygen throughout all the tissues and organs. So hypoxia, hypoxemia, initiates erythropoietin release to stimulate red blood cell production. In addition to that, 
the kidneys transform calcitriol into calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. And calcitriol circulates in the blood and plays a vital role in regulating calcium and the phosphate balance in the body, which is essential for healthy bone growth. If we look at renal pathophysiology, and we're only looking at it briefly without any real depth, we're looking at three main components. And the first component is pre-renal, which this occurs before the kidneys, pre-renal. And pre-renal failure typically occurs because of poor perfusion, blood supply, to the nephrons, which in turn leads to a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. And typically, it's intravascular volume depletion that's the most common cause, hypotension, shock of any cause, anything that causes renal hypoperfusion, pre-renal failure. Then you've got intra or intrinsic renal failure, now referred to as acute kidney injury. And intrinsic or intra-renal failure or acute kidney injury occurs when there's direct damage which causes renal insufficiency or further failure. The most common causes are acute tubular necrosis, related maybe to antibiotics such as aminoglycosides, mental health medications such as lithium, and cisplatin nephrotoxicity. The intrarenal is essentially direct renal trauma caused by drugs, toxin, inflammatory diseases, infection, and renal hypoperfusion. Then you've got post-renal problems. And post-renal failure or kidney injury occurs when there's an obstruction in the urinary tract below the kidneys. And this causes wastes to accumulate in the kidneys. The injury occurs after an acute obstruction of urinary flow, which increases intratubular pressure and decreases glomerular filtration rate. And this could be obstruction in the urinary flow as a result of hypertrophy of the prostate, which can be benign or malignant, renal stones, a tumour, or an injury of some kind. What are some of the mechanisms related to solvent or solute removal? Diffusion is the first one that we're going to look at. And diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration till it becomes equal. So locally, high concentration, it disperses out from an area of high to low and eventually an equilibrium is obtained. This is diffusion. Osmosis is another mechanism and it's a process where molecules of a solvent move from a solution of low concentration to a solution of high concentration through a certain permeable membrane. So water molecules move from an area of low solute to high solute concentration. Water molecules move from low solute to high solute until the concentration of osmolarity is equal. Low concentration, the solutes can't move. It's the solvent that has to move. And as it does, it will continue to do that until the equilibration is basically the same. It's the movement of solvent from a low to a high solute concentration, osmosis. Then you've got ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration is where the solvent is forced through a semi-permeable membrane, the high molecular weight solutes remain on the retentate side, retaining side. The solvent and low molecular weight solutes filter through to the permeate side, which is where it can permeate through to. So it's separation of the solvent and plasma water, because that's what the solvent is in the blood, 
from whole blood through a semipermeable membrane caused by a pressure gradient. This can be a positive pressure that pushes the fluid through the semipermeable membrane, or it can be a negative pressure which pulls the fluid through the semipermeable membrane. It can be a combination of both. You can have a pump pushing the pressure and you can have a pump pulling the pressure. The retentate is what remains on the side prior to the semipermeable membrane. The permeate is what goes through the semipermeable membrane. Ultra filtration. Then you've got convection. Convection is the movement of solutes in the solvent through a semipermeable membrane with ultrafiltration also referred to as solvent drag. And this involves a pressure gradient that exists between the two sides of the semipermeable membrane. When the molecular dimensions of the solute are such that the passage through the membrane is possible, which means the solvent can go through, the solute is also dragged along through the membrane with the solvent if it's small enough to go through. So if the solvent goes through, the solutes are dragged along. If they're too big to go through the semipermeable membrane, they won't be dragged along. Only small solutes will be dragged with the solute. This is convection, also known as solvent drag. Solution goes through the semipermeable membrane, and if the solute is small enough to go through the pores of the, the, the semipermeable membrane, they will be dragged through. Then we have the mechanism of adsorption. And this is the mechanism of adhesion, sticking, of solutes in the solvent to the semipermeable membrane, which takes them out of the circulation. They're stuck. And this can include toxic cytokines. It's defined as the deposition of molecular species, small molecules or large molecules, onto the surface of the semipermeable membrane. The molecular species that gets absorbed on the surface is the adsorbate. And the surface on which the adsorption occurs is called the adsorbent, the semipermeable membrane. The adsorbate is what's stuck. The adsorbent is what it sticks to. And in our situation, this is the semipermeable membrane. And this is very important in CRT in relation to inflammatory cytokines which we'll discuss when we look at some of the mechanisms that are provided by CRT in later learn shops. So let's review. Ultrafiltration is essentially plasma water removal. And the ultrafiltrate is the removal of plasma water which occurs when a solvent, a fluid, and the solutes, solutes in the solvent are pushed across a semipermeable membrane due to some pressure. It can be positive, or it can be a pulling pressure, negative. Hemofiltration is another mechanism, and this is plasma water exchange. And hemofiltration is the simultaneous removal of plasma water by ultrafiltration and replacement with a solution that doesn't have what you want to remove in it, a buffered electrolyte solution. And this exchange process achieves a reduction in the blood concentration of toxins, which essentially purifies the blood. It decreases whatever you want to get rid of. Then you have hemodialysis. And this is solute removal. It's the removal of things that you don't want in the blood that are solutes. Things like urea, creatinine, uric acid, maybe potassium. And this is done by introducing a dialysate solution, which is low in whatever you want to get rid of. The dialysate 
occurs by diffusion and pulls metabolites like urea from the blood into the dialysate, reducing the unwanted plasma metabolites. Then you have a combination of both, hemodia dialysis, filtration, ultrafiltration. And this is where plasma water by hemofiltration and solute removal by hemodialysis occur. So hemodia filtration combines hemodialysis and the process of diffusion with hemofiltration and convection to remove both unwanted solutes and plasma water. Okay, let's review. Name three criteria for utilizing CRRT. You only need three for consideration to commence CRRT. And these are typically oliguria, anuria, azotazemia, uremic complications, severe hyperkalemia, severe dysnatremia, refractory pulmonary edema, which could be cardiogenic or pulmonic, removal of toxic cytokines, refractory metabolic acidosis, hyperperexia, removal of pathogenic proteins, imminent ongoing massive blood transfusions in someone who's critically ill, removal of septic mediators, which we said could be cytokines, and a sarca, multi-organ failure, and drug overdose and water-soluble toxins. What about five advantages of CRT compared to conventional intermittent renal replacement therapy? Well, the advantages could include, you only need venous access. You don't need hemodialysis staff. There are minimal fluctuations in the biochemistry. It's slow, continuous, and therefore considered to be more gentle than intermittent renal replacement therapy. It promotes hemodynamic stability. You can get greater accumulated clearances of urea, creatinine, or whatever you want to get rid of, because it's ongoing. It's not just for three or four hours as an intermittent renal replacement therapy. You can give intravenous and nasogastric nutrients. There's no need for a water supply. You've got that coming in bags. It minimizes and reduces cerebral edema and there's no associated disequilibrium syndrome. What about disadvantages of CRT compared to intermittent renal replacement therapy? Well, the disadvantages could include a risk of infection anticoagulation therapy and therefore bleeding. Coagulation of the filter and tubing because it's ongoing and there'll be an inflammatory response by the immune system of the patient to the tubing and the filter. Increased lactate in the filtrate solutions. Fluid balance errors, potential hypertension. It may promote hypothermia and look, the filter surface area is pretty small compared to your kidney. It's less than two meters squared. Okay, name four mechanisms of solvent and solute removal which we just discussed. Okay, the four mechanisms are ultrafiltration, hemofiltration, hemodialysis, and hemodiafiltration. So in conclusion, continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT, employs diffusion, convection, and absorption to remove solutes from plasma with a rationale for initiation which can involve renal and non-renal indications. CRRT is a major treatment strategy for acute kidney injury in critically ill patients as it removes not only waste products but other molecules such as cytokines, which are targeted for removal, especially in septic patients. The modalities of CRT, which will be discussed in the forthcoming loose shots, include continuous venovenous hemofiltration, continuous venovenous hemodialysis, and continuous venovenous hemodialfiltration. CVVHD hemodialysis uses diffusion, CVVHF uses convection and CVVHDF diafiltration uses both. Thanks. This is the end of part one for CRRT. Now review part two.
And please, as I've indicated in the past, if you find these Learn Shops of any value, please forward them to your colleagues or subscribe so that you'll be notified of other Learn Shops that may be beneficial to you. See you at the next one. Ciao now.